Uh, unity, unity doesn't mean uniformity, that we're all the same. That would be, be boring, wouldn't it? That would be quite bland. Well, actually, if we were all like me, I think it would be cool. But we don't want to all be the same. We, it doesn't mean, unity doesn't mean uniformity, um, but it does mean that we're moving together in the same direction. Like it said of the people in the, um, in the New Testament, they actually used to drive in Hondas because they were all in one accord. <laughs> That's a terrible joke, I know. It's a really bad joke. Hey, has anybody been... Uh, let me just pray one more time because I need to pray. Jesus, we just thank you for your goodness. And we just thank you, God, that as we worshipped you this morning and our hearts and our eyes were fixed on you, Jesus, who you are, what you've done for us, we just want to rejoice in this incredible hope that you've given to us. Hope of eternal life, hope of abundant life, hope of life with you now. Thank you, God, that you died on the cross and your death and your resurrection meant that we can have access to the very heart of the living God who created this universe, who sustains it with his very word, who happens to be our wonderful, loving Heavenly Father. And I pray, God, that, that you would even, by your Spirit, uh, this morning, this moment, just take that revelation deeper into our hearts, that, that we are with you. You are Emmanuel, God with us not just in good theology, not just in good ideas, but you're really, really with us right now. Even though we can't see you with our eyes, we can experience you in so many different ways. And I ask that we would be open and available and ready to experience you even today and in the coming days ahead. In Jesus' name, amen. Has anybody been watching the uh, World Cup? The football, the, the football. Come on, les bleus, allez les bleus. My, my team is, uh, my team is, I was going to say it was, but they still are my team, even though they lost badly, uh, was Brazil. And um, so as, it, as it's supposed to be, you know, the people who beat your team, you're supposed, you're supposed to be supporting them. That's how it works in my mind. So I'm supposed to be supporting the, the Belgians. Um, but their, their, their team is called the Red Devils. Uh, that's hard to support a team called the Red Devils. So I'm going to go for the French. Yes. Yes. <laughs> I wanna, uh, there's something quite amazing that I actually uh, first read. And then I looked at some video clips. And the English, talk about the English. We just talk about them in passing really quickly. Uh, but... but but the English coach is an interesting man. His name is Gareth Southgate. And uh, he used to be a player uh, a number, well, 20-something 20, 20 years ago. And in the 1996 um, Euro Championship, this is the European teams playing together, each country playing together. And in 1996, they were playing, English, Eng England were playing against Germany for the title. And by the way, just so as you know, soccer, like when you're playing for the Euro title, I know this is a sports analogy, but stick with it. Um, you know, um, when, when you're um, playing for the Euro title in football, it's like playing for the Stanley Cup, it's like playing for the NBA Finals, it's like playing for the, the Grey Cup, all in one. It's a really, 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 really big deal. And so England were playing against Germany, and... You know, 90 minutes of a regular time, and uh, the, the scores were still tied. They played an extra half an hour, as they do, and this, the thing was still tied. And so they went to penalties, okay? And the Germans, you know, they alternate. German, English, German, English. It comes down, so they're all tied all the way, okay? And it comes to this man, Gareth, Gareth Southgate. And he misses his penalty, and England loses the Euro title. The, can just go to the next slide? Oh, I can do that. Sorry. Shush. Yeah. So that's Garrett Southgate on the right hand, on the right picture. That's 1996. Okay? Um, 
And of course, he's being wonderfully consoled by one of his uh, team, one of his uh, coaches, or whoever, whoever that guy is. He's being consoled. That's, that's in 1996. Uh, England recently played against Colombia, and so, very similarly, they went all the way to penalty kicks. And one of the Colombian, actually two Colombian guys, missed their goals. And so England won. But here's what the coach did. Gareth Southgate, the guy who lost in 96 by penalties, he went to console the uh, Colombian guy, his enemy. I mean, not his enemy, en enemy but his, the guy he was playing against. And he went to console him. And I thought, what a beautiful thing. This guy who knew what it's like to lose badly and to have a whole nation hate you. By the way, he, he was the guy for all these 22 years. He's the guy who missed the penalty. He's the guy who missed for 22 years. Gareth Southgate is the guy who missed the penalty. And now after 22 years, by you know whatever the gods of football or whatever, uh, they won the. I hope, that is, I hope that's not sacrilegious. Uh, you know, it's the gods of football. There's only one God, okay? Relax. Um, uh, so, so next... Oh, I can do this right here. Shush. So here's what he said, Gareth Southgate. He said, I've learned a million things from that day when he lost the penalty, when he missed the penalty, and the years that followed it. When something goes wrong in your life, it doesn't finish you, and you should become braver, knowing that you've got to go for things in life, and don't regret because you didn't try to be as good as you might be. I think that's very profound. That's very, very profound. Because failure is never meant to uh, stop you from from pursuing your God-given goals. Somebody also said that if you've never failed, it means you've never really tried at anything. Because if, you could, if you've never failed, it means that what, what, what you've been trying to do is very easily attainable, but you haven't been dreaming big enough dreams. Your dreams haven't been God-sized dreams. And so... Um, that just really ministered to me what this guy said. And um, somebody else said, I think it was Mark Stibbe, or somebody put a lovely definition on it. He said that your failure, failures shouldn't define you. They should refine you. Failures aren't meant to uh, define you. They're meant to refine you. They're, they're meant to make you stronger. They're meant to help you reassess why did I, where did I go wrong, how can I make the correction, how can I cor make my course correction, and how can, how can I do better next time. That's the best response to failure, isn't it? And it applies to us as Christians as well. Especially if we're pursuing dreams that are bigger than the ones that we can we can achieve in our own strength and our own ability. And that's, what, that's what God is calling us to, to dream big and to do the impossible. Amen? Amen. So, that's my little football thing there. So, to get to the meat of my message, here we go. Um, I wrote in my last blog, for those of you who read the, read the blog, God bless you, those of you who don't, God bless you. Uh, I, um, I, I, wrote, I wrote on my blog, I found this, quote. in fact, I was looking for this thing for the longest while because I was so convinced that it was C.S. Lewis who said this. And so I was Googling C.S. Lewis and, and, and what I could remember of this thing, and it would never come up. And then and in my, you know, as I read different things, it dawned on me that it was actually John Bunyan who said this. Anybody know who John Bunyan is? He's the author of the book, the classic, Christian classic allegory called The Pilgrim's Progress. It's a beautiful story. He wrote this in the 17th century, and even today, 400 years after, people are still referring to that book, and people are still reading it. Amazing. He wrote that book from prison, everybody. He wrote that book from prison. He was in prison for 12 years because of his faith. 
It was a political thing, you know. Um, he, he was part of a, what was called a non-conformist church, basically not a state church. Okay, so when the state church, when, when a monarchy was restored uh, in England, the state church took over again, and so every other church was actually uh, banished and squelched. But because he kept on preaching, they actually imprisoned him. And that's where he wrote uh, the, um, the Pilgrim's Progress and a whole bunch of other things. And one of the statements he made is this one. It says, this is such a powerful statement if we can pay attention to it for a moment. Run, John, run, the law commands, but neither gives us feet nor hands. Far better news the gospel brings if it, uh, it bids us fly and gives us wings. Run, John, run, the law commands, but never gives us feet nor hands. Far better news the gospel brings. It bids us fly and gives us wings. Isn't that good? That's so wonderful. Here's how uh, the Apostle Paul speaks about it. For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh... God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fully met in us, not in Jesus, in us, who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. I'm thinking that this message is just a simple message and I'm afraid that maybe we think that we've already heard it. And I know we have, but I'm hoping that the Spirit of God will breathe on this and, uh, you know, take it deeper into our spirits and let the revelation of how it would, of, of what it means for our daily lives, it would make a difference. So there are only a couple of things I really want to say. And the first thing is that um, I'm, I'm, actually, I'm actually going to end with a, a, a personal uh, testimony, a personal story of how this really makes a difference, has made a difference in my life, and how hopefully it'll make a difference in your life as well. I talk about John Bunyan, you see, he can, he can make a statement. I mean, many people can make a statement like that. If you read the Bible, right, you can make a statement like that. The law is powerless. Grace is the thing that enables you. And so you can, you, you can say that. But here's a man who knows what it's like to be impacted in a life-transforming way by the grace of God. Because even in prison... He, you know, the, suffering the harshness of prison, he could still say that. Right? He can still say that. Um, run. Let's read it again. I just love it so much. Run, John, run, the law commands, but neither gives us fe feet nor hands. Far better news the gospel brings. It bids us fly and and gives us wings. See, because the law or religion, what it does is that it gives us rules and regulations to follow. Actually, impossible rules, unattainable rules and regulations to follow. And it never helps us. It just says, do it. These are the rules. Don't, don't do this. Don't do this. Don't do, do this. Do this. Do this. It gives us a list of things to do and don't. And it never helps us or empowers us to fulfill those rules and regulations. Yes. Right? That's what the law does. That's what religion does. An impossible standard of behavior uh, that we can't reach. And, and what's even worse, it says that unless you reach that standard, you are unacceptable. 
That's the worst part, isn't it? But the gospel calls us to something superior to rules and regulations. It calls us, calls, calls us to an intimate relationship with God. It calls, calls us to an intimate relationship with God. I know many of us have been Christians for a while, and often when you've been around something long enough, there's what's referred to as the, famili- the, 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 f- fil- the contempt that comes with familiarity. And we sort of, we lose, the, we lose our first excitement and the incredible revelation that hits our heart when we first come to the realization that this God of the universe, the God who spoke the worlds into existence, uh, you know, who spoke to stars and it came flying out of his mouth at the speed of light and he created all these things and he created you and me. This God is wanting relationship with us, like intimate relationship with us. He, want, he's, he's, he called himself Emmanuel, God with us. Not just that, but his promise is he's given to us, those who believe in Jesus, he's given to us his spirit a deposit guaranteeing what is to come. We have this life of God on the inside of us, don't we? And he's offering to us access to his very, very nature. And so what what uh, Bunyan says is that the gospel doesn't just tell us to run, but the gospel tells us to fly. Yeah. Right? Yeah. To fly. And it gives us wings. It enables us. It calls us to fly and says, here, I'm going to help you fly. I don't want you just to be running. I want you to be flying. And I'm going to help you fly. That's the gospel. That's the good news of Jesus. So every single thing that God has made accessible to us through Jesus is actually there for us to help us live the life he's called us to live, isn't it? The main thing, though, is that we have to believe the right thing, don't we? The glory of the gospel is that the righteous requirements of the law have been met in us. Yeah, we're happy with the idea that the the requirements of law are met in Jesus. He died on the cross for us. He rose again from the dead for us, and he's alive forevermore. That's true, right? He's the one. He's the superstar. But what this verse is saying is that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully fulfilled in us. It's fulfilled in us. In other words, Those of us who live according to the the Spirit, not according to the flesh, have actually met the righteous requirement of the law. So we don't have to try to fulfill any more laws. Right? Even the evangelical laws that we make up, we we, we don't want to follow Old Testament law, but we create our own evangelical laws, don't we? If you're more old school, like some of you guys are, It's no smoking, no drinking. And the list continues, right? Because if you you smoke and you drink, you can't be a Christian. How many people come from that sort of background? Yeah. Even some of the younger ones. Wow. But even more subtly, we, we create rules as well. Even us, even within the catch the fire, you know, the, cut, the so-called cutting edge movement or whatever it is, we still create laws, you know, even a grace-based church like this, or like a movement like catch the fire is supposed to be, we still end up making laws and, and rules and regulations that we, that we, that we uh, think we have to follow. For example, if I want more anointing from God, I need to fast more. I need to pray more. I need to read my Bible more. I need to witness more. I need to sin less. And if I do that, I'll be more anointed. Oh, some heresy coming here now. The fact of the matter is, what is it that pleases God? What pleases God? 
faith pleases God. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. What, what God is really after. In fact, one guy came to Jesus and said, what, what, do I what work do I have to do in, or in order to, to enter the kingdom of God? And Jesus says, the work that you have to do is to believe in the one that God has sent. Believe in the one that God has sent. Faith is the open door to every single thing that God has for us. Believing the right thing is so important. Now, don't misunderstand. I'm not negating for one moment the importance of praying and fasting and reading the Bible and doing all those Christian, dis those Christian disciplines. I'm 100% for that. But here's the point I'm trying to make. If we do those things in order to feel accepted by God, if we do those things in order to, to please God so He'll bless us, answer our prayers, we're actually making a big, big mistake. We're negating in some ways, in many ways, what the gospel is. The gospel is first and foremost believing and receiving everything that Jesus died to make possible for us. Amen? Let's have a hearty shout of amen or something like that. Amen. Just one more simple thought and then we'll pray. I'll tell you my story and then we'll pray. The glory of the gospel is that the righteous requirements of the law are met or is met in us. Right? And so he condemns sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us. And everybody in North America who reads that is reading it. The righteous requirement of the law is fully met in me. Because we all have a very uh, individualistic relationship. But I looked it up, okay, in the Greek, and it actually says, met in us, plural. All I want to say there is this, that we have to place a greater value for us, for the body of Christ, for the church. I know that in contemporary culture right now in the Western church that everybody is, feels the freedom to do, do their own thing. And in so many ways it's good because you can flick on the TV or you can flick, you go to the internet, you can watch your favorite speakers, whoever they may be, Bill Johnson or, or whoever it is. And it's, that's all good. I'm not saying, I'm not negating any of that. The trouble though is that if that replaces fellowship and church life with other believers, I think you're in, making a massive mistake. A massive mistake. Because you can sit and listen to a, a message, for example, on uh, love. You can listen to all the virtues of love or on, on peace. But you will never know what love is or how to experience love, or how to receive love, or to give love away, unless you're in a community of, 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 believe, of other human beings who rub you the wrong way. And then you have to learn what it means to love, like biblical love, like loving your enemy, and loving people you don't like, and loving those who offend you. You will never know that sitting in front of your computer, only. You have to be part of a vital uh, group of people that are on the same page, moving in the same di direction, trying to make a difference in this world, isn't it? Come on. So, that was my uh, point I wanted to make about in us. Uh, so much of the Old Testament, so much of the Bible is written to groups of people, right? The community of faith, right? I think there are 22 times it says in the New Testament where uh, something to do with each other, love each other, each other. You can't be alone and love each other. You have to be in a community to love each other, care for each other, each other. 22 times it says each other. So much of the Bible, New Testament, is written to groups of people, uh, com communities of faith. Amen? So, here's my story about accessing 
the, what Jesus has made available to us. Um, on Friday night, this is just bringing it home, you know, very personally, directly, concretely, this whole big theological idea of, you know, God is with us and everything that he's given to us, uh, we have access to, all right? It's like God has put, the old King James Version is, he has imputed his righteousness to us. So that's why we can say that the requirements of the law have been met in us because he's imputed and given to us. It's like if we have a bank account, and our bank account all of a sudden goes from zero to a million, a billion dollars in our bank account. And faith is the thing that accesses that billion dollars. Okay, so here's what happened on Friday night. Uh, uh, we were relaxing, watched some TV, went to bed. And at about two o'clock in the morning, I was wide awake, suddenly startled wide awake. Panic. Panic. My, whole, my heart was racing. Uh, my breathing was, uh, was uh, shallow. I was lying down, and I couldn't stay lying down because I felt like, I was, like this whole thing was coming in on me. <sighs> Claustrophobia. The last time that happened was when we were just in Jerusalem. And, um, when we, you know, some of you know we went to Jerusalem about a month ago. And we were in, our, in Marnie's house. Marnie's going to be here end of J- July. We were in Marnie's place. The second night that we arrived, um, went to bed as, as usual. And, I don't know, 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning, again, wide awake. Now, it was very hot. The room was stuffy and everything else. Um, but all of a sudden, this same sort of sensation came. Like I was just being closed in, like a strong, strong sense of claustrophobia. And uh, my heart was racing, so I got up from the bed. Uh, let's go back to Friday night. Got up from the bed, and um, didn't want to disturb Elsie, so I went outside into our living room, flicked on the light, and my my whole thing was like it was a bizarre sensation because I w- I didn't even think like I was saved, you know, um, and. Uh, so what I did was, I opened up the Bible. No, first, sorry, first I, I began to walk around the room, and I began to pray in tongues a little bit. Walked around the, we have a small apartment, so I walked up and down, all around, and then uh, picked up the Bible. And I, I started off praying, God, help me, help me, help me, be with me, Jesus, 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 Jesus. And uh, after, I do, after I did it for a while, um, it dawned on me that what I'm actually praying is not really faith at all. It's not based in faith. It's actually, I'm afraid. I'm just, God, help me, God, help me. And there's no faith in it. Um, so I switched my prayer, and I began to declare, God, I thank you that you're with me. I'm not praying, God, be with me. I'm, I'm declaring now, Jesus, thank you that you're with me. Opened up the Word of God, began to read Psalms. Blessed is the man who walks not in the, in the counsel of the ungodly, etc., etc. I am that man. I'm, I, I, don't, I, am, I walk in the counsel of the godly, not the ungodly. You know, I'm the righteous man. I'm the oak planted by the tree, by the rivers of living water, all that kind of stuff. He shall bear fruit in due season. I'm reading chapter 1, chapter 2. And, um, and then all of a sudden... It kicked into me beginning to pray for revival for the nation. <laughs> then I'm praying for Catcher Fire I'm praying for you guys, Catcher Fire Scarborough. You should be blessed by that. I prayed for you on, on Friday night. I began to pray and pray and pray. And so all of a sudden it goes from, oh God, help me, help me, help me, help me, to God, let's take this nation. Let's get this nation. Let's kick the devil out of this place. You see? And that's not because, that's only because I was stepping, as it were, back into the Father. I was stepping away from fear and anxiety and panic and all those sen- real sensations. I mean, they're very, very real, you know. But you st- I stepped back into it and stepped back into who I am and I stepped back into faith, into believing what the Bible says about who I am and I began to declare that. And before too long, it was, it was lifted and I was able to pray for revival and pray for this nation and pray for us. 
Amen? Amen. So one concrete way that uh, knowing who we are in Christ, what He's done for us, who we are in Him, changes the way that we see ourselves, the way that we see our lives. Amen? Amen. Go back to uh, Gareth Southgate for a moment. If we really understood who we are in God, we would really be living and dreaming about accomplishing far greater things than we are now. A, a, a bunch of months ago now, maybe even years now, a little while ago, I was uh, sitting uh, and um, contemplating and just talking to God, and I felt the Lord say to me, I want you to dream big. Pause. Bigger still. I want you to dream big. Bigger still. Because even when, oh, dream big. Okay, well, what dreams can I dream that would be big? And even those dreams weren't big enough. And so, the point I'm making is that if we really know who we are in God, if we really know that we have access to, as it were, a billion dollars in the bank account, in fact, something even more, even more meaningful than a million dollars in a bank account, we have the very heart of God, we have the very nature of God coursing through us. If we really got in touch with that and lived with Emmanuel with us on an ongoing basis, not just in church on Sunday, but in the grocery store, at the office, in school, wherever we are, if we lived with that reality, we would be able to access this intimate relationship that he's offering us in order that we could make an impact. In fact, the byproduct of living with intimacy with God is that we dream big dreams and we accomplish great things for him. Amen? So that's my, that's my word to you. What I would want to do is I want to ask, is there anybody in this room who sort of had experiences uh, like the one I just described, where you, there's, a, there's a panic that comes upon you from time to time. There's anxiety. If you wouldn't mind standing. If there's any, in fact, if there's any sort of fear that controls you, that limits you. I'm talking about controlling fears. I'm not talking about being afraid of your wife. That's a different sort of fear. <laughs> if you're afraid, if, if there are fears that control you and limit you and put a, a limit on what you feel you, you're meant to be, what you're meant to uh, call to do, I want to pray for you guys. And the same is how the Lord, by the power of His Spirit, helped me through that process on Friday night. I believe He's going to do the same thing for you as well. Yeah, if, if there's other people of faith who want to gather on those standing, that would be great too. But if you're there to receive, just receive. Father, we just thank you for the power of the cross. We thank you for what you've done for us, Jesus. We thank you this is real. That even in uh, panic-stricken states, we can call upon you and we can receive your grace, your enabling grace, your empowering grace. So, Father, for these ones who are standing right now, I take authority over every single thing fear, panic, anxiety, and I command those things to come off right now. Cease and desist in the mighty name of Jesus. I sever every demonic spirit attached to these episodes. And I command them to go now in Jesus' wonderful name. I release the peace of Christ, the shalom of Jesus, to come upon these hearts right now, these hearts and these minds, that the peace of Christ, the shalom of Jesus, fill them right now. <sighs> nothing missing, nothing lacking. Everything is right with the world. God is good and He's good to me. 
I only expect good. There's no expectation of bad. Let it be released into this room right now. Kingdom of God come. Will of our Heavenly Father be done in these hearts today. Help us to be in touch with who we are in you, Jesus. Help us to be in touch with who we are in you. Help us to be in touch with what we have available to us in you by faith, fully confident that you are with us. You will never leave us nor forsake us. And your power and your love are always available to us. And in you we are more than conquerors in Christ. Manifest your glory in these lives, I pray. In the mighty name of Jesus. In the mighty name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen. Look, yeah, give the Lord a hand. Expecting to hear some good reports. If there's anybody who wants a more specific prayer about anything else, please come to the front and we'll be happy to pray with you. Otherwise, we're dismissed. Have a great week, everybody. The Lord bless you. The Lord keep you. The Lord make, make His face shine upon you and be gracious to you and give you peace. All week long. Amen.